Peter Studies for making this uh, event possible. I'll, I'll thank you more later on. But for now, um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Morgan Robertson, Assistant Professor of Geography at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, back when we first conceived of this symposium on transdisciplinarity and contested ecologies, Morgan came to my mind immediately as someone uniquely qualified to discuss these themes. First, he's one of those rare individuals whose expertise and background straddles the natural sciences and the social sciences. He has an undergraduate degree in biology and anthropology from Grinnell, a postgraduate diploma in tropical geography at James Cook University in North Queensland in Australia, and uh, graduate degrees in geography from Minnesota and Wisconsin-Madison. In the past decade, he's established himself as a premier scholar in environmental governance, and specifically on wetlands policy. Uh, his research on wetlands mitigation and restoration and the commodification of ecosystem services is definitely among the most frequently cited uh, uh, work associated with the research on first world uh, political ecology and the neoliberalization of nature. Uh, second, he's one of those rare individuals whose work straddles the academy and the non-academic world. Uh, before taking his first academic position at the University of Kentucky, he was a research fellow with EPA's Office of Water for three years where he was a co-author of the Federal Wetlands Compensation Rule. And he's also a professional consulting botanist who's provided his services to wetlands restoration projects. In short, you're not going to find many people who are more steeped in transdisciplinarity and contested ecologies than Morgan. There's much more I could say about his accomplishments, but I think this very brief introduction gives you a good sense for why we're so excited to bring him here as a part of this symposium. Please join me in welcoming him.
allowed to come to the service at any particular moment. Uh, real life is messy, right? Any individual is not an avatar, is the word I used earlier, of a single discipline that makes sense of the world or research moment to moment, uh, using a number of approaches, sometimes simultaneously in ways that can be impossible to map. So nothing as, uh, as conscious as, as what he has talked about as, as, as transcendence, not something necessarily to be done as a conscious project, but something that happens anyway, something that is already always being done around us by us. Uh, it, it, that's, that's more the kind of thing I would like to observe and describe today. So what you're looking at is a string restoration site in North Carolina, it's called Jumping Run, um, that has been created in order to meet the conditions of a permit issued by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, a little bit of package discussion of 404 in here. Um, the Clean Water Act Section 404 permit program is, exists to regulate uh, dredging and filling in waters of the United States, which sometimes includes wetlands. If you want to build a mall or a subdivision or a road, and you want to fill in a wetland to do it, you have to get a permit from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And they will give you that permit in, in almost all cases, but they will say, as a condition of this permit, you must restore uh, an equal or greater uh, area sometimes area, depends how you measure it, the focus of, of, of some of my research, of wetlands. And this is uh, one of the sites that was restored. You'll notice it's described as a stream uh, in, in the slide, and it's described as a stream in regulatory documents. Is a stream the same as a wetland? Well, from the standpoint of Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, it is. It's the water of the United States. And 404 permits the kinds of appropriate compensation for impacts. Uh, you know, the discussion about what constitutes appropriate compensation was almost entirely carried out around discussions of wetlands impact from 1980 to the present. Around the, the late 1990s and really kind of peaking in the early 2000s, there was a regulatory anxiety that uh, 404 permits and the, the kinds of compensation sites that were being required was really just a sort of a wetland-centric kind of world, and especially in cases in the, in the American Southeast where you, you have most of the permits being issued for impacts to streams. So, um, you know, streams are regulated by the same uh, rule, uh, but are fundamentally different objects to scientists, if not to, to regulators. So you had a number of reports start, start to come out saying, well, how do we, we think we know how to describe an adequate wetland compensation site. We think we've kind of got a grip on that. It has a lot to do with botany and hydrology, and, and wetlands are essentially uh, sites that, you know, we might look at nutrient cycling, but, but there's not a lot of dynamism to a wetland site in, in, uh, in an ideal sense. They, they don't, what they don't share with rivers, what makes rivers and streams very different is, is uh, uh, you know, the constant flow through and, and energetic and physical um, engineering aspect of, of rivers and streams. So streams which are regulated by the same rule are obviously quite different sites. And the state and national regulatory agencies have been struggling to come up with a policy that says, what is a good stream? How do we know what a good stream is? And how do we require somebody to, to make one or to restore one as a condition of an issued permit? Um, so there's a national now, a national scale project to develop stream assessment criteria. How do we know what a good stream is? That's uh, being shown here on the right. This obviously is a much earlier document. And various state level uh, initiatives to, to accomplish the same goal. Sometimes these are, uh, the, the national effort and the state level efforts are articulated with each other and sometimes not. In NSF, sponsored research that I'm doing with a uh, hydrologist, hydrogeologist named uh, Martin Doyle, and uh, a geographer named uh, Rebecca Lave. Martin Doyle is at Duke University, and Rebecca is at Indiana. Uh, we're going to three states. We're going to Oregon, we're going to North Carolina, and we're going to Ohio to find out how uh, people in these particular regulatory settings are dealing with the complexity of stream ecosystems in a regulatory context in these three very different efforts to define the good and worthy and adequate stream restoration. The state of Oregon, and specifically, uh, which was 
Uh, Oregon and Ohio were my uh, two areas of responsibility in this research. Oregon's really teeming with activity in, on this front. And, and just from my, my research there last summer, I want to uh, lead you through a, a couple of um, objects or uh, techniques, let's say, that allow people from different backgrounds to come into the same room and agree or at least uh, discuss streams. And the different backgrounds uh, being mainly regulatory, scientific, and entrepreneurial. Um, I want to back up for a minute and say what I want to do with the first part of this talk is to lead you through a few different settings in which I found myself in uh, areas where transdisciplinarity just has to happen in a kind of a spontaneous way in order to, uh, to get something done from a policy perspective. Um, so in Oregon, this directive has been given. This is uh, the EPA, a uh, federal, or uh, you know, obviously a federal agency, has directed within the state of Oregon uh, that a, um, a issued rather a request of proposal to develop stream assessment criteria and say assessment protocols will describe how numerical values are derived for each stream function attribute, which is necessary to quantify each attribute such that it can be used in a mitigation accounting system, right, accounting for uh, permitted losses to mitigate or compensate for permitted losses, and that measures impact permitted action and benefit uh, mitigation actions. So ideally, who is answering this question? Um, it has to be, obviously, stream scientists involved in answering this question. It has to be regulatory staff involved in answering this question, because only regulatory staff, because stream scientists can tell you a universe of things about the stream, but only regulatory staff can put boundaries on that information to determine what will be useful in meeting the statutory requirements of the Clean Water Act. And then there is a third population I mentioned entrepreneurs. Who is creating wetland compensation sites? Who is creating stream compensation sites? Is it always the permittee? Is it always the person developing the mall or the parking garage or the, the subdivision? In some cases, yes, but in many cases, Increasingly, it is a third party who is developing these wetland restoration sites and stream compensation sites in order to sell them to the person who needs them, the permit holder. This person is called a banker, a stream banker or a wetland banker. And increasingly, EPA is interested in making sure that these, whatever assessment criteria arise to describe the adequate stream, also des describe something that can physically be made by an entrepreneur uh, operating under normal business conditions where they have to uh, you know, lay out expenditures but expect a reasonable return to allow them their business to continue. So you can imagine um, three different sort of disciplinary approaches to what might be the adequate and the good stream. Is the adequate stream the thing which satisfies the Clean Water Act? That's one view of the stream that should be created? Is the adequate stream that which can be constructed for less than it will bring on the market? Right? That's another very physical and very technical set of criteria that are suggested. Is the adequate stream that which meets uh, uh, dissolved oxygen and um, sinuosity criteria that might be expected by a salmon biologist or gravel, gravel size? that might be affected by uh, somebody who's concerned with the survival of a particular salmon run in a particular stream. That points you in a third different direction. They all have to come into the same room to develop a single set of criteria. So how do they, how do they start talking about these uh, three streams in a single way? So there's a population of about 20 or 30 people in Oregon, like the people in the Willamette Partnership, it's a nonprofit agency who's helping to develop They've actually received the uh, uh, approval for the um, to develop criteria for the Oregon Department of Public Lands, that Department of State Lands, I'm sorry. Um, and people like the folks at the Willamette Partnership are going to make the development of these measures happen. And in the course of our research, I've, I've talked to almost all of the, the people who are going to be doing this. They're loosely categorized, as I said, into entrepreneurs and stream scientists and regulators. And there are these tools that seem to be useful. And I want to hesitate 
boundary objects. That is, things that remain uh, similar while passing between different groups of experts. And, and that comes from Star and Greasemer in particular tradition of the social studies of science. I don't think of them that way because I think that as objects, they are apprehended fundamentally differently by each group and understood as different things by each group. So they don't maintain, I think, a coherent identity. Uh, but that's just my impression. And, and I think they can be understood using the boundary object language, but I, I tend not to, not to do that. Uh, one tool which was uh, universal in discussions about how you measure or how you define a stream is the concept curve, conceptual curve, to show relationships between stream restoration actions and the result that would be desired by somebody who might not be a stream ecologist. Uh, in this case, between improving the buffer vegetation and the cooling of a stream or the improvement of salmon habitat, whatever it is, it's labeled um, you know, effectiveness. Effectiveness at it doesn't matter what. Effectiveness at um, improving aesthetic amenities. Effectiveness at reducing nitrogen concentration. Effectiveness at doing something which is actually defined through regulation. Effectiveness at increasing uh, the profitability of the, of the compensation site. Um, whatever it is, you've got a biophysical metric down here, uh, which can be measured biophysically. And something along the side where whose units are a little more problematic. And uh, the thing that, the key thing to notice here is that it's not just any conceptual model, which are, you know, they conceptual models are quite common across the physical sciences. Uh, but it's, you know, one that does not have data, a conceptual model by its nature doesn't have data underlying it. It is not, it's something you take out into the field with you, perhaps, to validate, you know, to populate with data. Um, but the key difference here is, of course, that the y-axis is, is, is um, often a kind of a unitless, sometimes ordinal variable that has much more to do with the goals of people who might, as I said, not be stream scientists. Uh, this is not inherently a problem. The problem arises for stream scientists it is when these are used as if they were not conceptual models, right? This is one of the stream scientists I talked to. Uh, he, 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 he described the use of these models as conceptual curves that were used as if they were rigorously constrained by um, This curve in particular comes from the Northwest Forest Management Plan from 1990, uh, early 1990s, 1993 or 94, multi-agency report on the proper management of the, of the forests of the Pacific Northwest, those of you who remember the, the Spotted Owl Summit, right? this is one of the key documents that came out of, of that controversy. And um, because the report was authored by you know, an impressive array of scientists and agencies, it, it kind of gave license to people in Oregon to, to graph measurable physical phenomena against a y-axis of um, some kind of service to a policy goal or uh, a goal defined by stakeholders, right? Um, with often very little data to, to support the, the, you know, the particular shape of the curve. So you see these, you see these kind of response curves or concept curves uh, littered throughout the, the literature on uh, how to, you know, what constitutes the adequate stream, what constitutes a good stream. A good stream will have the following properties. Right? It, will, it will produce um, the kind of ecosystem services that people desire if you do the following physical, if you make sure that it has the following physical traits. Um, as he says, this is essentially an instinct. Right? This is essentially an instinct. What do you think the shape of the curve is? It's not an uninformed instinct, but it's an instinct nonetheless. So there are graphical or textual varieties of modeling in, in uh, sometimes step functions the use of ratio. Uh, related to this, right, but, it, but kind of opposed to it in a fundamental way, uh, the use of ratios in compensation policy has long been common in Clean Water Act uh, policy to require, for example, that you restore two acres of wetlands for every acre of wetland that you impact. Uh, in cases where very valuable wetland is being impacted, you might, you know, require a higher ratio. Instead of a two to one ratio, you might say a five to one ratio. Uh, in cases where the success of the compensation is in doubt, you might then 
require an even higher ratio. You can go up to the a sort of 10 to 1 ratios um, where long-term funding isn't provided. In other words, any, a ratio multiplier is used as a kind of a universal tool to manage risk and uncertainty where you have potentially incompatible concerns. Right? I'm concerned as a regulator that you're going to skip town before you complete the compensation cycle. So, or I'm concerned as an ecologist that you have inadequately characterized long-term ecological change in this landscape. I'm concerned as an entrepreneur, uh, I'm concerned as an entrepreneur uh, that if you require, if you don't require high enough ratios, people won't have to buy enough of my product to allow me to continue making money. These are completely different concerns about a single site, but they can all be addressed by the use of the ratio. Right? So again, this is kind of a uh, universal tool that unfortunately tends to, to work against the implied precision of the concept curve. The concept curve, for all its sort of lack of grounding in, in, in field data, potentially, it implies a certain kind of precision. That is, if you, if you do, you know, if you uh, achieve something like 0.2 value here, uh, then you've got, uh, you know, an effectiveness, and in this case, you've got to buy physical value. Value of 42%. With ratios, uh, you kind of wash out all of that implied precision. All of the hard work and ecological precision that could go into measuring uh, the provision of, a, of, of, of uh, the legal adequacy or the service adequacy of a stream um, kind of gets washed out by just, well, let's multiply it by two and uh, give us twice as much as you were going to give us. So we have a conflict between a kind of an economic logic which requires a precision of exchange uh, between what is lost and what is gained, and the uh, state regulators, in, 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 let's say a case where a state regulator might be concerned that the site isn't going to function properly, they say, well, we're worried about the site not functioning as a proper stream, so we'll impose a two to one ratio or a three to one ratio. Um, this, is, this is the state seeking an overabundance of certainty that compliance with the regulation has been achieved. So if you look at the uh, credit site developer, you're saying, look, you know, size of gravel is important for uh, stream function. And if you use these rule curves, you're, you're suggesting that, you know, some some gravel size that might be very, very uh, minutely different from another gravel size you might use could matter a lot. And you could spend the next 10 years making sure you get a decimal point right in the right place with your gravel size. But uh, what's the point of doing all that work if you then require me to do twice as much of it and give, it, give me a two to one ratio? Uh, you're going to get uh, a much bigger return on what you require with that two to one ratio than the return you get on me tweaking gravel size to an exact, uh, an exactitude. Uh, third tool would be the lookup table. As I was attending a workshop on stream restoration last year, I saw a presentation by uh, somebody who was really one of the foremost stream scientists in the world who had developed for the Corps of Engineers um, a, an Excel-based framework for planning and managing stream restoration projects, like you know, those you see in a regulatory setting. Uh, he called it TurboStream, because it was like TurboTax. You didn't have to know the tax code to get your return, nor do you have to know stream ecology to figure out how much of, uh, of and what characteristics should be required of a stream that you were going to, to allow to compensate for a permanent impact. The idea is you need a bare minimum of field data data that's simple to collect, and then you go back into the office and you sort of turn it through this massive Excel file with all the critical values embedded in lookup tables. And 95% of the cells in this program just self-populate uh, based on your initial values. You don't need to understand the stream ecosystem. This is a case where stream science has been encoded in a way so as to be useful to the regulator who doesn't have to be familiar with the science itself. Uh, I'll give you another setting. So I talked a little bit about banking and the business of banking. Uh, this is a, an example from my research in, in Minnesota on wetland bankers in Minnesota, entrepreneurs who create large acreages of wetlands in order to sell, sell them to permittees who need to buy them uh, as a condition of their permit. 
down and negotiate with, uh, you know, between buyer and seller. And the, uh, the outcome of a negotiation like that is going to be a price that, that reflects the value of the wetland. If both actors are responding only to their internal and inborn utility, both of them doing so with full knowledge on the banker's side of how much it costs to build the wetland, what kinds of mark, what kinds of other purchasers might be out there, you know, some market research determining what what the going rate is on the part of the buyer, how much, what's the opportunity cost here? Could I do it myself? What's the cost of doing it myself? Right, those are the kind of things you would want to see as evidence that price reflects value from very much within the doctrine and discipline of economics. And as economic actors in a market trans transaction, you would expect, again, that's your initial expectation, that, that they would give some evidence of being involved in these kind of internal discussions. In observing this market in Minnesota and talking to a bunch of bankers there, I, I, I just observed four examples of departure from this kind of disciplinary ideal of economics by people who didn't realize they were supposed to be disciplinary. Right? So key lesson number one, don't negotiate. <laughs> right? This is just an excerpt from an interview. Or that, and how do you set your prices? This is what we do at buy what the, customer, the market will bear. Uh, so I said, well, you're asking, you're asking the, the customer? You're saying, no, no, we just set it. We don't, we don't ask. We don't ask. Oh. oh, okay. So it's not actually what the market will bear. Uh, you set a price, if they don't fall, uh, that's it. And we might make a little money. Uh, this is a key departure uh, from a kind of uh, ideal approach. Number two, uh, consider non-economic factors in your negotiations. This is an interview with somebody who uh, was selling credits to a person she didn't know personally, but she, she sympathized deeply with the situation that put them in the position of having to buy credits. I just, I felt so sorry for that lady. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> uh, you got a soft spot for something. Okay. Um, Example three, how did you arrive at the price that you're, you're charging, 30 cents an acre? Well, uh, I get calls, this, uh, I get calls and some character calls me up from my people who are calling, what a price. You can't tell making thousand dollars an acre, that's not 30 cents actually, that's, uh, I'm not sure what the original there, that, that must have been a price of it. Okay. Anyway, it was poured over. Uh, you visit with them, right? This is the upper Midwest, you don't do market research, you visit with them. This is how you uh, set a price of the, the thing that's keeping you afloat as a business person. Um, and fourthly, the, the, the wetland bankers that I was talking to were you know, usually in business in fairly narrow uh, social circles in rural Minnesota. And you know, when you have somebody who is also interested in, 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 in the same kind of business, you probably know them. And so in this case, uh, you have a banker who's who's offering credits, and somebody down the down the way who's he's in a business partnership with is also offering credits. So you, you come up with a price, so you're not competing against each other. And this is kind of quite mundane, you know. I mean, it's the kind of things that we can understand as uh, uh, you know departures from a kind of economic ration, uh, rationality which we know we shouldn't expect in everyday life. But on the other hand, they do they are sort of speak to the fact that everybody, <coughs> the bankers included, are you know, embedded in networks that exceed the breadth of whatever object it is we're studying, that whatever thing it is that we're curious about that they're doing. These bankers are seeking stability within uh, larger networks that involve you know, acquaintances in rural Minnesota, um, the larger housing development community, rather than maximizing their transaction by transaction profit, setting prices only one of many, many uh, decisions they have to make about achieving personal financial stability, whether, when their identity is not only that of a producer of credits, right? Uh, this kind of situation just constantly demands transgression, constantly demands uh, transdisciplinary every day. Um, during my time in, uh, Working as a consulting botanist, I was employed to do vegetational surveys of wetland bank sites to certify that the, the commodity 
being sold at these wetland bank sites for sometimes up to $50,000 an acre actually existed and had measurable quality. The rules for how you do this were set by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the agency which, as I said, issues the permits. And the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers tells the bankers what counts as an adequate wetland. One of the things they wanted us to do was to identify a, list of, a full list of plants occurring at the site. Now the problem uh, is that we're typically doing field surveys in, in early May to mid-June. And whereas you think this would be an issue of simply applying academic botany to the site, the problem is that most plants are not really flowering in Wisconsin and Illinois in early May to mid-June. So you'd be looking at things like this. What is that? Well, it's, it's a picalia, but you have to you know, be very familiar with the, the, uh, the plant to properly identify it. And you still couldn't prove it to the satisfaction of an academic botany. So identifying non-flowering material to the species level is something that most academic botanists will simply refuse to do because you, you, you can't always be sure uh, and you are unable to move through the typical taxonomic keys that you are, you are given. Uh, you don't have the morphological features that you need. So instead, we, we relied on what I have described as shared myths, ad hoc taxonomies that were based in botanical knowledge but designed with the kind of workarounds that we needed to get us an answer to the question, is this a good wetland? Which couldn't be answered strictly within scientific ecology. You know, we'd say things like, um, I think this is Asteroncherionis because the hairs are kind of like this instead of like that. There are several species that that could adequately describe, but what's necessary here is to sort of portage ourselves between statements relevant to science and statements relevant to state regulation and capital. Sometimes uh, we couldn't make that, that leap, and sometimes we could. Sometimes we had to, to sort of help each other out. There was a, a, a case where I brought back a sample to our, uh, our gathering place in the evening, and we'd sit around with a bunch of uh, fellow uh, employees of this stack of vegetation on the table, and um, we were, you know, handing plants around to try and sort of help each other identify these plants, hoping that somebody in the adult would kind of kick in the gear and be able to say, that I think is the, the following plant. And there was one character in our, in our, uh, in our tableau who was agreed upon uh, to be the, the expert at the table, and I would, I would, I took this plant and I handed it to him and I said, well, what do you think this is? typically would be very kind of physical in, 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 in his encounter with the plant. He would feel it and wrinkle it and kind of taste it and smell it and wait for something to bubble to the surface. And he'd look at this and he'd kind of frown at it and manipulate it and said, I think it might be a stenophyllum. And I, I pressed him to tell me how he knew that, what, what was kind of coming to the surface for him that would allow me to do the same thing in the future. And he said, well, it's kind of wispy, <laughs> which wasn't really helpful. I mean, there are a lot of wispy plants in the Chicago region, <laughs> right? Um, and, uh, you know, his puzzlement is, is a way of gesturing at the fact that we were making a passage between two logics that couldn't really be defended and, uh, you know, couldn't firmly be grounded in the authority of either economic or governance or uh, certainly science. And the passage rests on having people who will be there in that moment, in that talk story room, to make that passage happen and for others to accept that passage. So these are all moments when we move from one discipline into a transdisciplinary space to make statements from one discipline that can circulate in another discipline. Let's look at a distinctly kind of non-mundane example of uh, in this case, the highest court in the land, to see what, what the final arbitration of truth looks like in a highly formalized, non-everyday setting, um, and how that relates to other disciplines. This is Justice Jackson's famous words uh, on the famous aphorism about the Supreme Court. Right? We are not final because we are infallible. We are infallible only because we are final. In the context, in this room, it is socially given that we are the highest rule in the land, not because we're right in all circumstances, but because 
that is the contract that has given us our power. Um, there's a key, I bring this up because there's a key quotation from the U.S. Circuit Court decision on whether or not EPA has the power to determine that carbon dioxide is, is a criteria air pollutant under the Clean Air Act, right? And here the court is saying, hey, we need science to make this decision, but science cannot rule our decision. We cannot operate without science to answer this question. But if uh, we wait for the frontiers of scientific knowledge to be fully understood and demand rigorous step-by-step -step proof, as a scientist would, we would be preventing EPA from doing the job Congress gave it, right? It's articulating the absolute need for knowledge from another discipline, but saying it cannot circulate in law the way it circulates in science. This is what I mean about it not necessarily being a boundary object, it, because it's operating in a completely uh, different way, but it could well be described as, as a boundary object. Um, Jackson is pointing to the fact that you know the rightness of a fact will vary from situation to situation. If you're located in the Supreme Court chambers, it's absolutely clear. It's also clear when you are in the laboratory. It's clear when you're in the marketplace. But it's less clear when you leave these places of refined purity and you find yourself in uh, most of the rest of the world, which is composed of in-between spaces, where we have to summon a lot of different disciplines just to get through the day. That's where most of us spend our time. Um, so I want to retreat now, or I don't know, I may have to retreat into the theoretical, because um, I've given you some material <coughs> cases to chew on. It's tempting to sit here and say, well, look at all the world of difference between different disciplines. Wow, science is different than law, it's different than politics, it's different than economics. We're not really interested in their differences, or we might be, but we're also interested, interested in the fact that science has power, and law has power. Uh, science may have power over policy. Economics may have power over law. We're interested in the inequity and the relative power of these different disciplines. Not just the ways they interact, but the ways that they can dominate or determine one another. We're not just interested in, in how the court considers atmospheric science, we're interested in how to make scientific information more influential over what the court does. Some of us are, some of us are not. You know. So there's a question, similar question that was asked by a sociologist named Bob Jessup, who was interested in, in the sort of long-standing question in, in Marxist economy about, you know, is the state simply the, the handmaiden of capital? What's the relationship between the state and capital? I'm not going to go into that, obviously, but it's just a sort of a long-standing question that Jessup said, look, the whole question of determination, does capital determine the form of the state? Is the state somehow determinative of the flows of capital? It's the wrong way to ask it. What you've got is two different logics that can have dominance over one another, but really depend on the kinds of what he calls forums of articulation between them and how those forums are staffed by people who can make capital influential over the state, or science influential over capital. So he answers a sort of a long-standing philosophical question by turning to uh, a sociologist named Nicholas Luhmann, uh, who basically articulates an idea which I'll diagram out in a second, articulates this idea that society is composed of these different logics in and, and specifically, modernity is composed of competing and different logics, which are sort of contingently articulated with one another in the achievement of different projects. And Lumen is particularly, he's making this point specifically because the sort of um, standard narrative about the transition to, to enlightenment modernity is the primacy of the single grand narrative of knowledge, the, the pursuit of, of truth with a capital P. And this is actually, if you look at the movement from medieval Europe to sort of Enlightenment Europe, you see the replacement of the single authority, the king, godhead, whatever, with distributed, de sometimes democratically represented, but at least distributed authority. The multiplication of truths and authority is the hallmark of modernity. And so Lumen, as a sort of philosophical point, is trying to say, we've got a lot more diversity and disciplinary truths out there than we had circa 1500. Right? So we have to find some way of representing that. And he turns 
to, um, he turns to, oddly enough, Chilean biologist uh, Francisco Varela, who was describing how, how brain cells work. He says brain cells uh, are what he, he uses the term autopoietic um, or autopoiesis, self-organized. Brain cells, I guess, let's go back one. Brain cells are structurally closed, right? They have that phospholipid bilayer, which prevents material, non-water uh, soluble material, from moving from the outside of the cell to the inside. The brain cell is actually a completely closed, physically closed, or also, environment uh, in, in the structure. And yet, cells communicate with their outside environment, and they do so through proteins embedded in the cell membrane. Uh, some kind of chemical encounters the exterior of the cell, it encounters a receptor site and a protein. The protein then signals the interior of the cell as to what has happened. So they are informationally open or operationally open. And Varela is not blind to the sort of social implications of this, and Varela himself is a kind of a, a you know, cross-disciplinary writer. But, um, in describing systems which are completely logically closed, right? Like law, like the law, the, the logic of economics, the logic of science. Each of these logical systems has its own sort of pole star of truth. And yet, they require information from their structural outside. Economics can't work as a logic unless law is there to define property. The state cannot govern an environment that scientists cannot describe for it. Those, those descriptions cannot originate from within the state. The description of property cannot originate from within economics. They, have, they require the active participation of other disciplines. And they articulate with them not directly, right? The legal information doesn't circulate within economics qua legal information as legal information. It circulates as economic information. What you have are these key moments, these forms of articulation between these uh, sort of logical realms that Luhmann and Jessup are describing. These can obviously be picked apart, but you have something arguably called science where the truth, the truth standard is falsifiability. You don't determine the speed of light in the Supreme Court, you determine it in the science lab. In the Supreme Court, the standard is legality and its arbiter is, uh, is are the justices. In, in, within the law of the state. In the capital, you have a true standard called utility, and it, the arbitration happens in the market. But you cannot, right, you have information that must flow between these, these sites. What happens when you get these people out there, there's a picture of these regulators walking out on that wetland bank site. Those are regulators who are trying to take, and, and as, as I was on, the, on the, 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 you know, the team where we were identifying plants, we have to take information from science and make it circulate within capital, and make it circulate within the state. And we can't do so by respecting the logic of science. We have to be transdisciplinary at that point. We have no choice, otherwise the bank project doesn't get certified and we don't get paid. So uh, again, this is a fairly mundane and not to, you know, conscious form of interdisciplinary. This is, in fact, blessed explicitly by the MRC in saying, in deciding how to value ecosystem services or uh, you know, features of the environment, ecologists must create output that can be used as input into economic analysis. They're sort of you know, warning ecologists in a way. Like you can model all kinds of things, but make sure that what you do is legible to economists. right? can circulate within an economic model. This is a kind of a, a hierarchy that, is, that you know, some ecologists are not, not always um, comfortable with, of course. Uh, and I just want to end with, with, um, uh, with that rather sobering thought, uh, but really with the thought that Lumen's lesson about disciplines and this sort of general sort of model of how disciplines work is, is humbling in a way because Lumen in creating that, that model of, of, of uh, autopoiesis, uh, disciplinary autopoiesis, is saying 
And you know, in our science, it's flexibility. If, on the other hand, we respect the structural closure of each discipline and don't try to hammer it open and make its statements legible in the context of other disciplines, but rather try to maximize the operational openness between disciplines and to create and foster forms of articulation that are well staffed. Right? Because it's, it's actually often true that the forms which should articulate between, in any given case, between science and capital, or between, not to use abstractions, but between the DNR and the business community, or between um, any two interests that might, might respect different standards of, of verity or of, of assessment. Those forums may exist in a formal sense, but they're often not well staffed. And they're often not, you know, the people who should be doing the hard and daily and mundane work of, of making these, making knowledge move from one discipline to another are simply not doing it because they're not paid to do it. They're having a day off. Nobody's been employed to fill that position. It's, it's often a very uh, mundane set of, of questions to be asked about why and how transdisciplinarity happens. If we maximize the operational openness and try and foster moments of articulation, new relationships of independence can evolve. headwater stream. So if you take an impact to something the 
size of the Milwaukee River, and you compensate for it by, by restoring uh, uh, you know, something that is a comparative trickle. You, the reason you do that from an economic standpoint is that it's way easier, right? It's cheaper, you deal with much far fewer landowners, you don't involve yourself with water rights and withdrawals and water levels. Uh, but that understanding of equivalence is, is really strongly contested by ecologists, by stream, by stream scientists. They say, look, you know, if you're gonna pay attention to one thing about streams when you're considering what's a good stream replacement, pay attention to stream order. You know, that's, that's really important. Don't allow the compensation in headwaters to compensate for impacts of river um, And the price of that is that you, you lose a whole lot of complexity about the, about the differences between different kinds of headwaters. But the gain is considerable. I mean, yeah, scientists tend to walk into these discussions with their eyes open about what is possible to be. Could I piggyback on that question? What aren't the, the contextual issues equally important for that sort of judgment? I mean, uh, you know, if, if I'm going to replace one stream here with an, quote, equivalent stream, unquote, somewhere else, how do you determine what that is, given that the context is very important? Well, that's, that's the meat of the discussion in this kind of forum. What counts as equivalent, right? You, you find a lot of, in, in this kind of discussion, you find a lot of economists saying, if you're going to measure the value of the stream, the value of the stream is the value to people. So if you replace you have a loss of a stream in, you know, uh, Milwaukee or some particular neighborhood in Milwaukee, those people there have lost that value. If you replace it in Madison or in somewhere up north, that loss to those people, you know, if there's nobody, because it's often it's often the case that you find compensation sites in rural areas with very few people because the land is cheap. Well, if there's nobody there to value it. So you, you've lost that value. You can't consider that an equivalent, uh, equivalent in, in the proper sense. Now, at that point, the regulators are going to say, we do not have congressional license. We don't have, the, the EPA is going to say, it's not part of our mission to consider economic value in that decision context. Right? When we consider values, we're talking about the you know, chemical, physical, and biological integrity. And that's what we're allowed to measure. If we start, if we start measuring, it's true that we could start to measure economic equivalence in terms of people's appreciation of, of the what's lost in the competition sites. That's, we're worried that if we do that, we're going to get, you know, we we don't have explicit license to to do that, and so we're going to get sued by uh, the, the, let's say the wetland bankers who want to sell credit. Um, so the context is absolutely important. The context is constrained by, in this case, the, the logic of the state agency. Uncertainty and how you characterize risk is, is one of those things that's natively different to each, each of the logics that I'm familiar with. And that's where I find 
time, you know, making those, those your, your neurons talk to each other, is I find that it, within those different domains, you have fundamentally different yeah. contextualizations of, of certain things. And, and that's why, I mean, it's important to look at failure in, in articulation. You know, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's easy to tell a kind of a happy story where, and I mean, I think you were, we were sort of getting at this with, with Karen's piece, is that what happens when, you know, you've got fundamentally opposed Absences of people to populate these forums is 